All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys having me out here today. This is a really great topic and one that I get to share with students of all ages at different levels, but it's great to kind of dive in head first to identifying threats to our local coral species. So just to start off today with our first picture, I just have a picture actually of our invasive species team. The DLNR is part of the state's aquatic management uh, division. And so um, what our focus is, is really managing, protecting and restoring all of our aquatic ecosystems, um, managing our fisheries. And that definitely includes being aware of what's going on in the ocean and what type of health and condition our coral reefs are in since those support our fisheries and beyond, both in fresh and salt water. So what we're talking about today is also Eyes of the Reef. Eyes of the Reef is a great program that has come up through the Division of Aquatic Resources as a way to report threats to the aquatic ecosystem here in Hawaii. What we realize, and it's a pretty obvious problem, is that no matter how many biologists and technicians we have who we assign to each island for monitoring, coral bleaching, fish health, things like that, we'll never be able to cover as much ground as there are people just in the water recreationally. So we always like to say, you're swimming in your backyard 20 times more often than any of our scientists will ever be there. So we wanna make sure that people understand that they have the eyes on the reef and if they have the know-how to identify these healthy or unhealthy signals, um, we can kind of evaluate health and get a first um, reporting system set up for the state to realize, hey, there's a problem in our reef. So what we see here, getting on with our presentation is kind of where did the eyes of the reef come from? Well, like we said, there is a need to address Hawaii's uh, resources and maintaining them and reporting network to get people to get enthusiastic about what's the health of our reef? What are the questions we need to ask? What are the things we need to look for? One of the best ways to manage and mitigate invasive species or coral disease or coral bleaching is early detection, knowing it's happening, getting ahead of it. We've seen things like gorilla ogo. That's a big buzzword here in Oahu. That's a sick case of we didn't realize it was spreading. And once we did, it was way too late. Once we realized that it was a huge threat to our aquatic ecosystem, it had already made it to every single island. So by getting early detection, by having community members report things that they identify as changes that could be negative to the reef environment, we really get a jump start on being proactive in our ability to protect these resources in our aquatic ecosystems. So Eyes of the Reef originally came out of this Hawaii's Rapid Response Contingency Plan. We have some of our founders over on the side there. And this was really the start of Eyes of the Reef and the start of community reporting here in Hawaii. It was a project unlike any other. And the biggest part of this is that the Division of Aquatic Resources was one of the biggest partners in this. This was a way that made sure that the community's voices were heard. There's a lot of networks like this, but if they're volunteer run, there's not necessarily a biologist or somebody who's a big decision maker at the end of the chain who can really take that information or that potential threat and bring it up to, let's say, the red zone where it needs to be, where we have scientists in the water within a day to two days reacting to what the report may be. So what we're gonna do today is just a small, small portion of what the Eyes of the Reef curriculum is. Overall, the Eyes of the Reef training goals are to get people to identify in a basic sense, what types of corals are out there, recognizing diseases, categorizing them briefly, also differentiating between natural things such as predation on a coral. There are some fish out there that eat corals and a coral disease or coral bleaching. What does it mean if a coral is bleached? Is it dead already? These are all questions that we wanna make sure that the average person here in Hawaii, especially the snorkeler, diver, or somebody who's involved with the ocean, even fishermen, can answer. The curriculum for Eyes of the Reef is also designed for elementary school and above. So this is something that's easily accessible for all people. That way we can get the most amount of people identifying from a young age, what's healthy in Hawaii? What do we want our reefs to look like? Not everybody's gonna make it here to Hanama Bay to compare their local reef to what a pristine reef can look like. So at the end of all of that planning, 
with the Eyes of the Reef program, we came up with a reporting system and a reporting form. These forms were the original paperwork that you had to fill out in order to let us know what's going on. We've luckily digitized all this and made it very easy. So you can find this online and all of these categories you see broken down will actually be available to you in drop down menus. So it's really easy to fill out where you were, how long you were out in the water, and then most importantly, what you saw. And the big categories that we broke down these reports into were fish diseases, marine invasive species. So that's going to be things like invasive algae, invasive fish, invasive invertebrates, even things like octocorals. And then also coral bleaching and disease and crown of thorns sea stars. So those are some of our largest threats. So those became some of one of our, one of our largest focus with our reporting network. Um, within this whole network, there's also information that goes along with it in order to allow people to better evaluate their space. We give some information on how to broadly identify your corals and how to estimate if it's 25% affected versus 50% affected. We have a lot of simple ways for the average citizen or youth to be able to tell us some basic facts about what they're seeing and why we might want to go investigate. So. Like I said, you can find us online at eorhawaii.org. That is our website. And you can also find us on Facebook at Eyes of the Reef Network. And you can just search that. It's very easy to find. So these are great ways to stay involved. Like I said, today we're just covering a portion of the curriculum for Eyes of the Reef. So you can find more of our training modules on our website. And you can also find out when we're going to host full trainings on our Facebook page. We also like to post news articles that involve things that maybe we want people to be aware of. Should we expect bleaching in 2018? Should we expect bleaching or disease in 2019? Is there an invasive species that we want people to keep their eyes out for? You can find that on our Facebook page. And this works statewide. So whether you're on Maui, Molokai, Lanai, Big Island, you can still get some up-to-date information. So. What we see here is some of that basic uh, curriculum kind of broken down into what you can learn as a member of the Eyes of the Reef, especially through one of our longer trainings. And like I said, today what we're going to get into is just a portion, and that portion is actually going to be identifying threats to coral in particular. I know we have a lot of divers here in the audience, so I wanted to focus on something that was really relatable that people saw every day. Sometimes we see so many different fish, it's hard to keep track, but we see corals all the time. And if we break them down into small groups, it becomes a little bit easier. So this is where the presentation gets a little fun because this is the same presentation I give to my kindergartners, my first graders, my second graders, things like that. But I think at the end of the day, it always makes sense to start really simple with coral because you may not have heard it the way that I like to teach it. And I always think to myself, man, I wish somebody just told me that one fact and I would have understood coral really quick. So I'm going to give you guys the kind of five to 10 minute quick breeze through of let's understand coral, make sure we're all on the same page before we start talking about what can hurt coral. So a lot of us know coral is made up of polyps. Coral can be just a single polyp. The best way I like to get kids to think about this is put your hands together, palms next to each other. Your fingers are tentacles. The center of your palms are the mouth. It's like an upside down jellyfish. Understanding coral polyps is one of the biggest parts to understanding coral and what can happen to a coral. We understand through a coral polyp that a coral is an animal, not just a plant, not a half plant, half animal, but it's an animal with a mouth and tentacles that can catch things and pull them into its mouth. Now we also learn about zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are something that we always want to make sure people understand. And so that's a big concept for a preschooler or a kindergarten. How do you tell them that there's something living inside the coral? Well, the best way I like to do this is say, who made your breakfast this morning? And most kids will say, oh, my mom made my breakfast. And it's like, well, sometimes we need help to make our food. So do corals. Zooxanthellae are doing that for the corals. They're helping them make food. And one of the biggest things that I always want people to understand is I asked them, do you think if we looked at a coral just now with our naked eyes that we'd be able to see the zooxanthellae? And people say, no, look at this picture. It's a microscopic picture. There's no way. But I tell them, hey, what color is that coral? And they say, oh, it's green. I say, what color do you think those zooxanthellae are inside the coral? Pointing to that picture in the bottom corner. Because the coral you can see there is actually translucent. And they say, green? 
and that's it exactly. And then we go around the room and I have the kids actually tell me based off the color of their shirt, what color their zooxanthellae would be. And we learn that the zooxanthellae is the expression of color that we most commonly see in the coral reef. So when we see a healthy coral reef, we think of lots and lots of colors. Well, those colors also equal healthy algae living inside the coral, helping create food. So when you go to the reef or you even watch Finding Nemo, you can say, hey, all those colors means those corals are A, healthy, and B, that they're getting extra food from that thing that lives inside of it, even if you don't remember the name. But I think zooxanthellae is a pretty fun word. So hopefully most people remember that. Finally, once we understand that, it's really easy to understand bleaching because I say, hey, if we know coral gets its color from the zooxanthellae that live inside of it, then what's going on with this coral in the bottom picture? It's got no more color, which means it has no more zooxanthellae. So just like that, we understand what coral bleaching is. For me, that was at least three weeks of college classes. <laughs> so, so I'm really happy that I've been able to compartmentalize it, hopefully in a way that people can understand what bleaching is. The coral isn't dead yet, but we see an absence of those zooxanthellae, which was your mom, your grandmother, your dad making you breakfast this morning. And now all of a sudden, you're not getting breakfast, you're not getting lunch, and maybe you're just kind of getting dinner. So this is one of the ways that we can kind of get kids especially to understand what the effects of bleaching are and what the effects of a lack of zooxanthellae are. Question? Do any of the stony corals have uh, pigments? So some of the stony corals do have pigments on their own. Fungia in particular has a brown pigment on its own just in part of the coral's body. So not all color comes from zooxanthellae, but let's say most color does. And especially when we think about coral broadly in a way to understand bleaching, we want to keep it simple. So we just say, you know, the majority of color we see on the reef comes from the zooxanthellae inside of it. Because when those corals bleach, most of them are going to start turning white. And that's the color that's underneath all those zooxanthellae giving them pigment. So what we can see here are some corals that obviously still have their polyps and have turned white because they've spit out their zooxanthellae as they become stressed. So we can understand bleaching really simply now. Now when we see a coral reef like this, a healthy coral reef, we can say is there algae in this picture? Absolutely, the zooxanthellae inside of every single one of those corals. And if somebody said no because we don't see any big macro algae, we say, well, it's in the belly of all those fishes. So all those fish, oh, excuse me, all those fish are an essential part of this healthy ecosystem. They are grazers. They're keeping that algae community down so our coral community can thrive. This is what a healthy coral reef looked like. Lots of coral polyps, lots of coral colonies, and all those things together create a coral reef. So in order to drive this point home to every person here in Hawaii, we say, do you think a healthy coral reef equals a healthy Hawaiian community? If you said no, Sorry, that's the wrong answer. This is absolutely true. We thrive off of a healthy coral reef for lots of different reasons. We know that we need to keep our corals healthy if we thrive off of that. And here are some of those reasons why coral reefs help us out. They're offering homes for crabs, fish, shrimp, lobsters, all the things that here in Hawaii we especially love to eat out of the ocean. But as we know, especially here at Hanama Bay, we have a whole industry built around looking at these things in the ocean. So we need to protect them not only for what they do to support our communities, but to support our different industries here in Hawaii. Supporting tourism, you can see there, supporting fisheries. Also protection of our shorelines. We're always in danger of waves, threatened from tsunamis. These corals are what are giving us protection around every single island to break up that water as it comes closer in towards shore. So these are essential parts of what kind of make Hawaii a livable habitat. So if we love our beaches here, if you love your poke bowls at the shop, you love coral too. So once again, we're always just trying to work to make sure whether you're in kindergarten or an adult, you're finding a way to relate to coral because it's important to you, even if you don't go in the ocean. So. We want to understand that there's things that naturally harm coral, like things that eat it. We're going to dive into these a little bit later, so I don't want to spoil the lead and tell you what they are, but take some mental notes. We're also going to talk about things that can naturally happen to corals in terms of getting sick. Do corals get sick like we do? Absolutely. The question is, how often does that happen naturally, and how often does that happen with the assistance of something that's man-made? So. 
when something like this happens to your coral reef or which we see a lot of here on the windward side of the island, something like this, standing on coral reefs, anchors on a reef in Kaneohe Bay with all the boat activity. We wanna make sure that events like this don't increase the ability for these natural threats to happen. And that's why being aware of not just what's the proper etiquette around coral, but also what's naturally happening in coral and what should we expect to see and what can happen if we allow things like this to continue? You know, what do our reefs stand to lose or what more can they lose? So last thing, I know that you guys, if you've listened to some of the other talks, have already learned a lot about invasive species. So I just want to plug that because that's one of our programs within Division of Aquatic Resources. We also ensure that the reef is clean and free of invasive species because coral health depends on this as well. So just to give you guys an example, if we don't take care of our reefs, one of the biggest things we can see is a phase shift. And a phase shift is a dramatic change caused by, let's say, a sewage spill or caused by, let's say, an invasive species taking over. We can go from a perfectly healthy reef, which we see here, to an algae-dominated reef. And remember, like that first picture I showed you guys of a healthy coral reef, where's all the algae now? Well, right now, it's probably in most of those herbivores' stomachs, the fish swimming around. But once we have an invasive species or the tides turn where those fish no longer have homes, we don't have any mitigation for that invasive species or that algae overgrowth. So being aware of these kind of effects, knowing that this can happen if we don't get a head start in terms of identifying problems on our reef, this is what we can be left with. And if you've been here in the water at Hanama Bay, imagining a change from what we have now to this is very, very dramatic. So that's once again, why we wanna be ahead of the game. So getting into the meat of our presentation here, we want to talk about identifying coral impacts. I broke it down pretty simply. We're just going to have two categories that we're going to kind of dive a little deeper into. First thing we want to do is identifying coral, identifying what types of coral are out there. So in a general sense, oops, in a general sense, we have a lot of different shapes that we've become familiar with from TV shows to documentaries. So brain coral, one of everybody's favorites, branching corals mushroom corals over on the side there, lettuce corals, encrusting corals, uh, cauliflower corals. There's even pork chop coral out there. So <laughs> all of these different types of corals we name, especially with our eyes visually by shape. However, here in Hawaii, we're lucky because we don't have quite the diversity you see in this first picture. We have a little bit less, and that's a good thing in terms of us getting used to what we see in the water and identifying different corals. We have very unique corals here in Hawaii, and that's what we're gonna learn a little bit about. So the basic categories for our corals that we're gonna break down in our Eyes of the Reef training is small branching, rice corals, smooth corals, and corrugated corals. So. As we break it down into these four categories, it gives you some pretty obvious things to look for. And this allows us as a scientist to take a report from, let's say, a first grader who's only identifying, oh, it looked like a smooth coral or it looked like a big boulder. We can figure out at least what he probably means if he's using some of these words. So as we go into our first category, small branching, what we can see here is it's just like the name, small little branches. This is gonna be our antler coral, cauliflower coral, and lace coral. Lace coral tends to be a lot more delicate than that picture there with a lot smaller finger. The biggest thing here is any kind of coral that spreads out, like if you spread your hand out, is gonna be one of these small branching corals. Our next category, rice coral. Just like the name, it looks like there's little tiny rice grains all over it. It's one of the easiest to identify. This one's typically encrusting, so you'll see it covering a boulder, not necessarily creating a large mound of its own. Some of them, especially the purple ones, tend to grow little small towers in them where worms actually have lived. Do those have a different species of zoanthellae? Exactly. So the color in a lot of these will have a different zoanthellae that's inside of it that's exhibiting that color. So depending on the genetics of that coral, so some of them will be more reddish, some of them will be more brown. And what could happen is if those are two, let's say, separate species or let's separate individuals, their color will be slightly off. They'll actually never grow together, even though they're the same species. So what we see here is, yeah, the kind of uh, exhibition of different colors through zoanthellae. So what we can see here is rice coral once again, blue rice coral as well as brown rice coral. 
All right, so getting into our next category, smooth coral. This is our finger coral, mounding coral, plate corals. Easiest way to imagine all three of these different categories though is that they're all smooth. They all have no small bumps sticking up like our finger coral or like our um, branching corals and like our rice coral. So these are some of our reef builders. So if you go out to a reef, you see lots of large structures, especially some of the biggest corals that you'll find here in Hawaii. These are going to be our mounding corals, those ones that are two, three hundred years old, the size of a boat down underneath the water. Those are going to be our big mounding smooth corals. So we can see some more here. We see a little bit of our smooth corals, our finger corals. Definitely easy to tell the difference compared to that rice coral. Finally, our last coral, corrugated coral. This one's a little tough to imagine, especially for younger kids who might not know the word corrugated yet. <laughs> So I tell them to look in between cardboard and they can see what we mean, but it means just fold it over and over and over again. This one also gets a name here in Hawaii that's not, let's say, an official name, but a way for some people to remember it, and that is false brain coral because it has those squiggly lines through it. Here in Hawaii, though, we do not have any true brain corals. So one of the biggest tips with this corrugated coral and the best way to identify it maybe if you're not sure if you're seeing it or not it tends to grow in holes like uh, dark caves underneath things it doesn't tend to like that full sun exposure that we see with some of our other corals so if you're ever on the hunt for it flip over a rock or kind of look underneath or below some structure and you might see some of this if you think you see it sitting out in the open i think about some of your other categories is it smooth and it maybe just has a little bit of texture to it or is it bumpy like that rice coral because rice coral like i said will have those little nubs on it instead of these folds so what we're going to do is just go through some pictures here and see if we can identify visually especially for those who are watching online some of our corals here so we have two categories or two categories of coral represented in this picture what we can see is in the center lots of little bumps just like little rice grains so that's going to be our rice coral on the outside of that rice coral, we see little pieces that look like fingers. Now, if we don't remember finger as a category, that's okay because at the end of the day, we know those fingers are smooth. So that's our rice coral and our smooth coral. So smooth coral, remember, can be finger coral, boulder coral, as well as plating coral, just as long as it's smooth. So in this picture, we have a healthy reef. This is actually a pretty tough one because we have a lot of different types of coral. But right up front, we see some small branching coral. We see how those are a little bit different than our finger coral. It looks more like a little tree. And then behind that, we see the smooth coral, those boulders, those lumpy, bumpy, like a burning, uh, expanding marshmallow kind of look to them. <laughs> you can see those kind of scattered around. So once again, we see lots of little bumps. Now the ones on the left look a lot more like rice grains than the ones on the right. However, since they both exhibit those tiny little bumps and they're encrusting, and remember I told you that rice coral tends to encrust and make the shape of the rock or take the shape of the rock, I should say. So what we see here is rice coral. These are both rice corals. So once again, that bumpy, bumpy shape there, that's gonna give you that rice coral. And as you guys can see, as scientists, we're gonna know the different species these are, but you're giving us a lot of clues to cue in. Was it a, dominated, a reef dominated by large boulders and large smooth corals? Was it a reef dominated by encrusting rice corals? And these grow in different habitats. So what we see here, this one's pretty tough. We see lots of smooth pieces on the outside and on that bottom right, we see some definite fingers. So that's gonna say, hey, Fingers, they're smooth, that's gonna be a smooth coral. Now in the center, we see some bumps, but we notice those aren't just like rice grains or like the little tiny bumps we saw in the last picture. Also, if you notice it's growing in a little bit of a cave structure, that's going to be our corrugated coral. So once again, you're gonna find that corrugated coral underneath things, stuck in the caves. Finally, this is one of our big pictures here. We've got a lot of different corals, but remember, I said those big stony corals, the smooth corals, they're the ones that create structures in the reef. When we see the big old 200 year old corals, that's a smooth coral. So in the back left and right of this picture, we see lots of smooth coral. The brown that's kind of encrusting, taking over the front of the picture right in the center, that is going to be our rice coral. 
And then down in front of that, we see lots of little fingers. Those are gonna be smooth again. So we have a big picture here, but we also see the community made up by a coral reef. If we are looking for corrugated coral in this picture, I'd say we need to dive in some of those dark spots between the corals to find it. So that will give us kind of some perspective about how these different categories coexist on the reef together. We're gonna to see some areas in Oahu that are mainly dominated by one or the other, but when we come across lots of them, especially at a place here like Hanama Bay, we wanna be able to identify the differences between the colonies because it's also gonna help us learn more about that ecosystem. So, in being conscious observers, being eyes on the reef, once we've been able to identify the type of coral, the next thing we wanna do in terms of evaluating coral health is getting to how can we make sure that we know is this coral healthy? What things does it take to identify coral health? So the first thing I want everyone to do, and this is great because it's something that kids can even do is, is there a change in color? We talked about at the very beginning of class in our little kids introduction to coral, Coral that's colorful is healthy coral. I like to say colorful coral reefs are healthy coral reefs. So if we see a change in that color, we know, hey, maybe something's going on. We don't always need to see a ton of algae just show up for us to say, oh, there's a problem here. We need to be conscious observers, like I heard some of you were today, and noticing, hey, there's a new fish in town. Hey, there's something I've never seen before. Or, oh my gosh, this coral that I've been swimming next to for three years that's always been green is all of a sudden looking like a toasted marshmallow. It's white and brown spotted all over. That's happened to me before. And you wanna know what's happening and that's a sign of stress. And so if there's something, let's say a sewage spill happening right offshore, we wanna be able to know how to report that. So getting into our coral impacts and what types of color change, here's kind of our four categories we're gonna get into when we talk about color change. We're gonna talk about bleaching and what color change in bleaching looks like, disease, predation, and then other impacts that we might see on a reef saying, hey, this doesn't look so healthy for a coral. This doesn't look so good. What's going on there? And we're gonna give you hopefully enough tools to figure that out. So first thing, identifying change in color. Well, one of the biggest color changes we're gonna see is it went from being colorful to being white. So. When we see that, we've got two things that we wanna figure out. If we see white on a coral colony, we wanna find out, are there polyps, like we learned about, that is the body of the coral, the animal, or are there no polyps? If you look in that picture on the left, it's that same picture I used for bleaching, and we can see all the little flowers that stick out. Those are all the polyps. On the picture on the right, we can see just bare skeleton bordering a brown tissue-filled skeleton. That's showing us a different story. The coral on the left is still alive. The coral on the right is only still alive where it's brown. So what we can see here is if we just said, oh, they're both bleached, well, we're not getting the real story here. And that's something that I've learned myself personally. Doing surveys, I've dove down on a reef, all of the rice coral was white. And I said, oh my gosh, it's bleaching. And then we swam a little bit closer and I didn't see any polyps. And the story was even worse. It wasn't that all the coral had bleached, all the coral had died. And so just by looking for those polyps using my eyes, I found a whole different story. So we already learned about bleaching. We understand that bleaching is the zooxanthellae being ejected from the coral. This happens when corals are stressed, whether that's from climate change or whether that's from sewage spills, or this can just happen naturally with normal temperature fluctuations. The issue is, is has something maybe man-made encourage that to happen more often? And that's something that we always need to be aware of. There's normal fluctuations, and then there's things that happen because of man-made issues. Looking at bleaching patterns, this is one of the biggest things to understand is the coral just won't be so obviously, it's the whole thing's white. Some of our corals can actually turn colors. So the pictures on the bottom right show brown and purple colors. We do have corals that exhibit those colors. However, some of our rice corals do bleach and turn more blue or more purple. The big lesson here is as an observer of your space, of your area, being eyes of the reef for your community, you're going to know because you've swam past that coral. Hey, these corals are normally brown. Hey, these corals are normally blue. And when they change color, I know something's happening and it's not a good thing. So even if they're changing color to a blue or a purple, we wanna know about that because that's a sign of stress. 
as you can see, the white can be splotchy. And in that top left picture, you really can see that toasted marshmallow look that I was telling you about that happens in a lot of our smooth corals as they bleach. So if we're looking at white on a coral colony, let's say we go the other route. We actually look deeper and we see that, hey, there actually are no polyps. So what's going on with that coral? What's happening here in the story? Because we know if the polyps are there, the coral's stressed, it's bleaching. Well, here's a little picture closer up so we can make sure that when we look, we see all those little holes, the calices where the polyps used to live, there are absolutely no polyps. And as we look into the brown color, we can see those little tiny mouths inside of all the little holes. So this is showing us a story. And one of the things that we want to identify is this can be predation or this could be disease. So when we talk about predation, we need to understand what are the predators of coral and what does their predatory action look like on the reef? Because this is something that naturally happens. If you see a starfish like this on the reef eating a coral and there's maybe three of them around, that's fine. Those are natural here in Hawaii. But if you see 50 of them, or recently we had a report of about 200 of them in a 300 square foot area, that's something that is a big herd of coral eating starfish that can take out a whole coral reef like that. So understanding what's natural and what's unnatural is one of these issues where we come into uh, saying, okay, there's natural predators, but what does it mean to be too much? What does it mean to be something I need to report? And so that's when we're going to see with all of these predators, it's when they overwhelm the coral. So fish predation. This is something we see really common with blennies, filefish, and parrotfish. They all make different types of marks. But what you'll always notice is like any good eater of, let's say, a natural resource like we should be, we don't want to eat it all at once. We want to take just a little bit, make sure it grows back so we can come back around tomorrow and grab some more. So what you'll see is very spotty predation. You'll see little mouth marks on the coral that show the different types of teeth, whether it's scraping parrotfish, parrotfish beaks or the round mouths of blennies, which kind of twist off some of the uh, tissue from the top of the coral, which you can see on the left side there. Filefish actually tend to poke at the tops of corals on the ridges. So you might see an area that's scarred over, over and over again. It's because the filefish is just picking off one little polyp at a time from the top of that coral. So this is natural predation, something that we are okay with seeing on the reef, but we know if we see a whole lot of this, maybe it's something we want to report. This also goes with snails. We have things, and I love doing this, especially with younger kids. We say, okay, what does a carnivore eat? Well, carnivores eat meat. Okay, what does an herbivore eat? Well, herbivores eat only plants. Okay, so what does a coralivore eat? And then they say, oh, I don't know. They only eat coral. And then they go, oh, oh my gosh, I should have known it. So these snails are coralivores, so they only eat coral, so they're going to prey on coral. These are natural. I guarantee every one of you have found one of these snail, snails on the, on the beach. It's called a droop or a drupelid. However, these snails, if something happens that's allowing them to bloom and increase their numbers exponentially, they can devastate a coral colony very quickly. So once again, something that we see naturally, but we want to be aware of, what does it look like if it's out of control? You'll know when it's out of control because there's going to be way too many. Finally, predation from crown of thorn sea stars. Sea stars are one of my favorite sea creatures because of the way they feed. They crawl up on top of the coral. And in this case, in the picture in our bottom right, we have a branching coral. And the, cor the starfish, when it gets on top of the coral, will excrete his stomach inside out on top of the coral and actually start to liquefy all that tissue before sucking it up. And what we see are the obvious scars of a, star, a crown of thorn starfish on this coral. Because they spit their stomach out, the stomach can't get down inside of all those cracks of the finger coral. So what we're going to see is bare tissue because of the predation, because the coral is actually being eaten, not just losing its zooxanthellae. But because of the way the starfish eats, we can say, hey, the coral was all alive way down in the center, down at the core of it. It was just dead on the outside. Well, maybe that was a crown of thorn starfish. So keep your eyes peeled for some of these starfish around the area. So once again, it's using all these tools that maybe we already have, but kind of putting some context to them in terms of what we're seeing on the coral reef. So finally, getting into one of our, our second to last category, 
We have identifying change in color. Let's say we see that bare skeleton, but instead of seeing that bare skeleton and identifying a predator around it, we see something that looks like a progression of color. And that's the big indicator for disease. The difference between just bare skeleton from a predator and the bare skeleton from a disease is progression. So in this picture, what we can see is in the bottom left, we have the coral where it used to be alive that has slowly been overtaken by algae because algae within hours of a coral dying will start to grow on that coral skeleton. However, as we move further, further, and, for, uh, further and further towards the top of the picture, we get to that live coral band that's kind of bluish brown. However, on that border, there's pure, pure white. That is where the disease is actively killing the coral. So what we can see is a progression from pure, pure white down to that algae filled brown color. And this disease has been spreading from the bottom of the picture towards the top of the picture. So if I came back in a week, I would expect to see the white line up at the very top of the picture and I would see algae covering what is pure white right now. That shows a progression of a disease across a coral. Fresh death, and as soon as that death is taken care of, there's no more tissue on the coral, algae will start to grow. So once again, if we see no polyps, we wanna be able to say, is it predation? Is there evidence of the way a starfish feeds, the way a fish feeds, or is it a disease, something that's spreading across the coral? Here are some other photos of what disease can look like. In that top left picture, you see our acute Montipora white syndrome. This is the disease that I saw personally on that reef. When I got in the water and I said, hey, oh my gosh, all these corals are bleached. They were actually dead. And this is something that was very similar to this disease. And what we can see is that pure band of white and that slow progression into the darker color on the right side. So what's again, that progressive tissue loss. We also see in the bottom left picture, strong banding, that dark black color. Megan Ross gave a presentation last week, I believe, about black band disease. But once again, a very simple cue to identify something's wrong with the coral. Question. Do the coral develop a defense? And do you notice it when you're looking at them? So I personally have never witnessed any types of defenses against diseases that are proactive against diseases. In terms of things that we've been able to do to stop these diseases, in that bottom picture, actually, you can see a little finger and a little pen. And we've actually tried to apply epoxy layers around the coral to stop the disease from jumping into the live tissue. And that's actually proven to be effective in certain areas. But imagine how many people would have to be down on the reef to treat every single coral if this disease is spread throughout an entire reef. So it really makes prevention hard, but that's one of the reasons why if we can identify these threats right away early on, we can do our preventative measures as quickly as possible and kind of get ahead of the game. Because once we're reacting to a problem that's already spread, our options are much more limited. So once again, kind of identifying what disease can look like, we see some new shapes and new kind of forms of white showing up on our coral. Because once again, we know color means healthy, so when we start to see new colors or white spots or any type of white, we know this isn't so good. So we see spotty white spots all over. doesn't really make sense. doesn't look like a predator. That's a multifocal tissue loss. That means it's losing tissue from lots of different spaces all over the place. Also, we have white band disease, which is very literally a white band across the coral, something that doesn't look like any predator. If you don't see a snail next to that white band that's going straight across the coral, there's guaranteed no predator there because our snail's pretty quick. Are they going to run away from that coral? No way. We're going to see them right where their food is. So looking at our disease varieties, we can break them down really simply. Tissue loss, once again, we're looking for that progression of color from white to kind of the natural color of, of the coral. or um, And then the other direction, getting more and more algae filled from where the corals died. Discoloration, we're actually going to hit that in just a second. So sometimes we see corals that don't look the same. We know that corals can be bleach purple or blue, but we also need to understand that there's some reasons that corals turn pink. There's some reasons that corals just might not look like we expect them to look like. And we need to have maybe some tools in our belt to say, hey, what could that be? Let me use my power of observation to look around this coral and see if I can identify some of those things I learned about that could irritate coral. 
Finally, growth anomalies. We've talked about diseases, but we also know that corals can get things similar to human tumors. These are gonna be large growths or perturbances off of the coral body that look mutated, that look kind of different. So in our final category, when we're looking at what types of change, we said, are there growths? Are there perturbances? If we see those, this is what they're gonna look like. As you can see, we have some smooth corals on the right side and then some rice corals on the left side. The left side, it obviously stands out, those white bulges, that white nodule in the top left picture. On the right side, same thing. All of a sudden on that smooth coral, we see discoloration and mounds. And if we looked closely at the polyps, those little tiny holes in the calyces there, we would notice that the polyps are actually misformed too. So these are gonna be mouths that are ineffective for feeding the coral. Some of them could be still used by the coral, but this is definitely a tumor, a growth that is going out of control. And this is okay, this can happen naturally, just like it happens naturally in people. However, once again, if you're swimming on your reef and all of a sudden you notice that 20 of the corals surrounding you all have these tumors and they never had them before, we know something has happened that's probably man-made that has increased the ability for this natural thing that's happening, this natural detrimental thing that's happening in terms of growing tumors to increase within the local population. So once again, it's kind of using the tools that you have of identifying your place, knowing what it looks like typically to see, hey, that's that one type of change that I learned about in Eyes of the Reef. So other changes in color. What if your coral's not turning white? Well, some diseases will change the color of the coral and make it just a pale color. So we wanna be aware of that. That's something that we don't see too often, but it's something that you can put together. If there's no other clues, this coral's pale. It looks like it's bleaching, but there's no, uh, there's no polyps, but it's just a different color. It could be a disease. Finally, like I said, sometimes we have other things that bother corals, other things that make corals irritated and changes their color. So we have coral competition. Like I said, even if they're both rice corals, if they're not the exact same DNA, they actually won't recognize each other as they're growing closer and closer. And they'll say, hey, there's a guy who's trying to grow on top of me next door. And so corals will actually fight each other for space. So what we see in these two pictures are very distinct white bands, which we may associate with predation or maybe there's some disease that's just starting right there or is this coral starting to bleach but if we look closer and we notice that there's two corals butting up against each other we can use our tools of observation to say hey i remember that there's that natural occurrence of corals butting heads corals defending themselves from another coral growing on top of them also Coral algae interaction. So this is an abrasion. We see the coral turning pink here and almost looking like it's peeling up off the rock. Well, this is one of my favorite stories that one of our founders, Greta Abbey, uh, shared with me. And it's really awesome because she took this picture as she was looking at this pink coral, wondering what type of disease is this? And what it actually was, was algae whipping in the waves back and forth on top of this coral, rubbing it, rubbing it rubbing it and sure enough that turned this coral pink and pulled up some of the tissue off the skeleton so this isn't something that is a huge threat this isn't something that you know you would need to report but it's something that we need to be aware of so we can better identify what's going on on our coral reefs second to last thing we've got here invasion sometimes there's things that like to live in corals worms barnacles mostly crustaceans so what we see here are barnacles living all over this coral. We also see a little Christmas tree worm up at the top. This is typical in any healthy reef ecosystem. As long as they're not outnumbering and detrimentally harming the coral, this is okay. Last thing here, we have shrimp who make homes in corals. So sometimes we see these lines through corals that look like somebody cracked it open. It's just a shrimp making his home inside. And finally, a crab burrow. There's crabs that make their homes inside of corals too. So with all this information, we kind of have all the tools and I'll skip through this part really quick. You guys can go over this online, but these are just some little healthier sick pictures. Um, we have all the tools to be able to identify what's a healthy coral look like? What's a diseased coral look like? This picture I include just so people can see on the tips of coral, sometimes we have little white pieces that's new growth. 
So something we can not associate with bleaching because we know bleaching happens either spotty on a coral or in a large section. This is something that we see pretty common around here, especially with our rice corals. A bleached coral, the polyps are obviously still there, but no color, and then a black band, diseased coral. Really simple identifications that any average snorkeler can make, and especially with these tools of the Eyes of the Reef program, be prepared to make a conscious and smart uh, report to our biologists that we can make decisions off of and react to. So thank you guys very much. This is our Facebook page. Feel free to visit us to look for any times we're setting up a new class. We'll hopefully be doing one here at Hanama Bay within the next year and uh, also within the community. If you guys would like to get one set up for your community, feel free to give us a call or an email at our Facebook page. Thank you guys very much. In that corner? Uh, where was that huge uh, invasion of cots, cot thorns that you were talking about? So the crown of thorns report that we got recently was off of the windward side. The special thing about that report was the guy who was diving when we got the report, I was like, oh my gosh, this looks really crazy. And then I looked at some of the information he gave us, like where he was diving and how deep he was diving. Come to find out he was down at around 220 feet. So he must have been, you know, diving with a rebreather doing, I think he's a military diver and he was just going out for fun, but came across this uh, school. And luckily we've been able to keep communication with him and he's updated us as he's gone out to the site again on the movement of the pack because for our divers to go in the water, we have a limit of about 120 feet that we can go to. So once they get up to that level, we're going to be ready for them. But it's great that we know that that's happening because that's almost kind of like a scary, um, you know, trudge from the deep coming towards our shorelines, right? So that's definitely how the reporting network can work to our advantage. And these reports come directly to us at the state so we can talk to the biologists literally that same day and say, hey, guys, here's the report. Here's what's going on. Maybe if you're out there tomorrow, go check it out, that kind of thing. And, oh. um, from the crown of thorns, uh, you were saying that they uh, extrude their intestines and stuff to eat, mm -hmm. and it doesn't always get all the way to the bottom. Right. So is it possible for like uh, the lip berry to come back into that area? So there's two different things happening there. If the coral is actually being eaten by the crown of thorn sea star and it's actually using its stomach to disintegrate that tissue, it's actually going to take all of those polyps away from the coral. So once those polyps are gone and that coral is just a skeleton with no tissue left on it, the polyps have no way of coming back to the coral because the pol or not the polyps, excuse me, the zooxanthellae. The zooxanthellae live inside of the polyps. So if there's no polyps, then there's nowhere for them to go back to. So if a coral was bleached, however, let's say there was a heat wave coming through Hawaii and the coral bleached for that week. Well, if the temperature returns to normal, the coral is going to settle back down, get less stressed, and it will start taking back in the zooxanthellae. So a bleached coral is not dead yet and it can get better. However, a dead coral with no tissue left cannot regain that tissue. So especially with younger kids, they always ask me when I have a coral skeleton, can we just put that back in the ocean and it'll come back to life? It's like, I wish that was the case, but it's only a skeleton now, so. It would be alive just where those, just where those dark spots are at the center. And then within the next day to two days of that open skeleton sitting on top, algae would start to grow and probably within a month those pieces would break off and we'd have a much smaller coral left over if if it didn't get preyed on by another starfish coming through that all of a sudden figured out like hey it's really easy to get down to the bottom of this coral when all the fingers are broken you know <laughs> that kind of thing all right mm -hmm. next question when you give classes mostly to younger kids you have videos to show the animal behavior of the pups. yeah so, 
So what I do actually for a lot of my classrooms and when I come to schools and I'll even do this for some public events is I bring a mushroom coral with me and I have it underneath the microscope connected to a screen. That way they can see a coral live in action and we'll actually feed the coral live on site. So we'll drop shrimp in and you can actually see little tiny shrimp being pulled in towards this coral's mouth as it swallows them and puts it straight into its stomach. So you hear the shrimp screaming? Uh, <laughs> uh, you hear the kids screaming as the shrimp slowly disappears into the coral's mouth. But it's one of the best ways I've found to really get kids right off the bat understanding that coral is a living thing. This is an animal that's alive. And so when you think about, hey, this is something that I've maybe picked up on the beach one time or something that I've stood on top of to call my dad, all of a sudden they see, oh my gosh, that mouth that I just watched pull in food is what I had my hand on top of. And of course they're going to ask, can it bite me? And you say, oh no, no, but maybe I should tell them that it can bite them. <laughs> yeah. So yes, right now DAR has accepted the science that's out that suntan lotion does have chemicals that can harm corals. So we're also pushing for oxybenzone free sunscreen here in Hawaii. And we'd like to see kind of anything chemically that can harm corals be, you know, looked into. I had a really awesome opportunity as we come into this new era of thinking of what are the chemicals that are in the water every day that we may not be thinking of that are harming our corals. So we think that sunscreen is harming our corals. The way that corals are recruiting now, the coral colonies we see now, that's all with heavy effects from sunscreen. So imagine what it could be like if that wasn't the case. We're already living in the affected environment. So one of the students that I worked with recently this year who was doing a science project had the great idea of thinking, hey, what's something else that people wear every day and maybe go in the water with? Well, she said deodorant. And sure enough, she looked at antiperspirant deodorant versus natural deodorant, antiperspirant deodorant, which has aluminum in it, lowered the pH, made the water more acidic. And all of a sudden it was a question of, oh my gosh, how many people are going in the water with deodorant on that could be negatively harming the environment? So along with sunscreen, I feel like in the future, especially with the kids coming up today, we're going to see a lot of changes in some of the products we use in and around our aquatic and land-based ecosystems. Has anyone made suggestions to the company making this instead of digging that yield to develop products a little bit more expensive that save the reef, mm -hmm. make more money, and they save the reef too? The biggest, just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, it's a big paradigm shift for anybody in that industry. And, you know, we can't say that because these sunscreens harm the ocean that you shouldn't use them when you're hiking in the forest. You know, that's kind of a controversy. And then a lot of these chemicals are also common in other products that aren't sunscreen. So banning them outright removes things without kind of a just cause. Like uh, some of these products are in makeup. And let's say, you know, you're not planning on going to the ocean if you're putting on this type of makeup. So that's kind of the issue where it becomes a lot harder for anybody out there to kind of say, let's just ban this product, let's just ban this. So I think we're at the beginning stages of what's going to be, like I said, kind of a big shift in the products we use in and around the ocean. That's why I suggest you tell them to make products that are better mm -hmm. and they'll make more money from them. Yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be a great idea. You had a question? I noticed that moms that uh, the sunscreen that have this bad stuff mm -hmm. is flagrantly displayed, but the other is really hidden. Yeah, and it's it's it tough. Really it I, I was assigned once to go to the uh, Long's grocery store and find what uh, reef safe sunscreens there were so we could have some options to recommend to the public. And it was tough. It took me a while of searching. Mm -hmm. And it's more and that's the thing what I found is some shops I've even seen have a natural sunscreen section where you can go directly to find all of their brands that are reef safe. So that's something positive, but unfortunately not everyone's bought into the push for these more positive ocean friendly products. So, you know, as more people buy into that and as more people kind of push for that, I think we're going to see it come more and more, you know, in, in the typical grocery stores we go to, because, you know, as we've seen this year, it didn't get forgotten about, even though it didn't pass last year in legislation. So 
<laughs> shelf space shelf space is demanded by the people making it not the people who are selling it right exactly so you know there's all the big business stuff so at least on our part at the ground level as eyes of the reef members and trainees we can understand what some of these threats are how man-made effects do push some of these natural effects into critical areas that harm our coral reefs and we can kind of be the entities to make those better decisions i think that's one of the great reasons why this curriculum is accessible for younger kids because they're the ones who are going to change their parents mind they're the ones who are going to push for these things in the future and seeing projects that are looking into things that are questions i never even thought of like oh my gosh is my deodorant safe for the ocean should i not be putting that on when i go out to the beach and it's like well why am i wearing it anyway i'm in the water right so you know it's like you never thought about that until you know a sixth grader asked me the question so that's all it takes so Hopefully, you know, we can all see that more and more as we spread this knowledge around. Does this get taught in every classroom? This specifically doesn't get taught in every classroom. However, I try to bring this to as many places that are willing to listen. So this is part of our generalized curriculum that we can offer to any community group, any school group. So if you guys have school kids, you know, teachers, you know, that you think would benefit from this curriculum, we can definitely do that. One of the best projects I did this past year was working with a boarding school up in Haula to teach them not only the eyes of the reef curriculum, but they took all this information and we went out to the reef outside of their school. And I led them in a survey where they were able to use all this knowledge and say, okay, this coral's healthy, this coral's sick, and it looks like it's sick because it's bleaching. And then they were able to put together a little data sheet that it, uh, talked about the health of their reef. And that was their whole goal. They wanted to say, hey, we want to evaluate our reef. reef. We want to find out what it means to be healthy. Well, here's the tools right here. It's the eyes of the reef program. You can't get a more simple way to identify what the big picture items are that are going to tell you, is my place healthy? Is my place unhealthy? So yeah, definitely. If you've got any kids out there, send them our way. We'd love to see them in their class.